My name is Sierra McKissick. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Hyde Park Arts Center, and we are really happy to be joined tonight by some wonderful panelists for our program, Arch Architecture of Black Lives, which brings together artists, scholars to meditate on the ways that Black people have found ways to commune and the architectures that they must navigate. Critical connections have been made that link the violent formations of the sugar and cotton plantations to the restrictions on Black communities formed during Reconstruction, to surveillance in the prison industrial complex, and the impacts of redlining on Black low-income housing projects. Groups such as the Black Reconstruction Collective and Black Space Urbanist Collective are interrogating these interlinked histories and the continued forms of architectural violence against Black life outside of captivity. With a particular focus on Chicago spaces, we will investigate how we can conceive of architectural forms that affirm Black life with artist Fahim Majid, interim director of Arts and Public Life and author of Black Skyscraper, Adrian Brown, author of Dark Space, Mario Gooden, and architect and artist, Amanda Williams. This event is in conjunction with our Fahim Majid exhibition, Planting and Maintaining a Perennial Garden Shrouds. It is also presented as a part of Art Design Chicago Now, an initiative funded by the Terra Foundation for American Art that amplifies the voices of Chicago's diverse creatives, past and present, and explores the essential role they play in shaping the now. Generous support for this exhibition is also provided by the host committee led by Jack and Sandra Guthman, Cynthia Husing and David Kirstenbroker, and Eric and Cheryl McKissack, and include contributions from John Ellis, Julie Marie Lemon, and Heirich Yeager, and Cheryl and Thomas Rubeck, and Freddie Smith. I would also like to welcome you all by offering a land acknowledgement, a small way to recognize and respect indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of the land that we occupy and their enduring relationship to it. We want to acknowledge that the Hyde Park Art Center has lived its entire 81 year history on traditional indigenous land. All of the Hyde Park Art Center's many locations have resided on the traditional territory of peoples, including the Peoria, Miami, Potawatomi, and Council of the Three Fires. Tonight, we are gathered together virtually and from across the country. Wherever you are, we invite you to learn more about the land where you live, work, or play. So thank you so much for that. Now I'm going to introduce our panelists and our moderator for the evening. Um, of course, the man who brought us all together this evening through his exhibition, we have Fahim Majid. Fahim Majid is a builder and literally and metaphorically a resident of the South Shore neighborhood in Chicago. Majid often looks to the material makeup of his neighborhood and surrounding areas as an entry point into larger questions around civic mindedness, community activism and institutional critique. As a part of his studio practice, the artist transforms materials such as particle board, scrap metal and wood and discarded signs and billboard remnants, breathing new life into these often overlooked and devalued materials. His broader engagement with the arts also involves arts administration, curation and community facilitation, all which feed into his larger practice. From 2005 to 2011, Majid served as the executive director and curator for the Southside Community Arts Center. In this role, he was responsible for managing operations, staff, programs, fundraising, creation, and archives for the Southside Community Arts Center. During his time there, he curated exhibitions of numerous artists, including Elizabeth Catlett, Charles White, uh, Jonathan Green, and Theaster Gates. He received his BFA from Howard University and his MFA from the University of Chicago. Everyone, please welcome Fahim. We also have Adrian Brown, who specializes in American and African American cultural production in the 20th century, with an emphasis on the history of perception as shaped by the built environment. Her teaching and research interests include critical race studies, architecture and urban studies, American studies, modernism, postmodernism, the Harlem and Chicago renaissances, popular culture, visual culture and sound studies. She also co-edited the volume Race and Real Estate, an interdisciplinary collection, rethinking the narratives of property and citizenship. Her book, The Black Skyscraper, Architecture and the Perception of Black Race, recovers the skyscraper's drastic effects, not only on the shape of the city, but the racial sensorium of its residents. 
the Black Skyscraper received the 2018 Modern Studies Association's first book prize. Everyone, please welcome Adrian Brown. We also have Mario Gooden, who is a cultural practice architect and founding principal of Huff and Gooden Architects. His practice engages the cultural landscape and the intersectionality of architecture, race, gender, sexuality, and technology. His work crosses the thresholds between the design of architecture and the built environment, writing, research, and performance. Gooden's performance include the motion of light and water, working on water, and black holes ain't so black. Gooden's work has been exhibited nationally and internationally, including the International Exhibition of Architecture Biennial in Venice, Italy, the Netherlands Architectural Institute, Storefront for Art and Architecture, the National Building Museum in Washington, DC, amongst many others. Gooden is also a professor of professional practice at the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation of Columbia University, where he is the co-director of Global Africa Lab and director of the Master's Architecture Advanced Studio Sequence. Everyone, please welcome Mario Gooden. And last but certainly not least, we have Amanda Williams, a visual artist who's trained as an architect at Cornell University. Her creative practice employs color as an operative means for drawing attention to the complex ways race informs how we assign value to the spaces we occupy. The landscapes in which she operates are the visual residue of the invisible policies and forces that have detrimentally shaped much of the United States. Williams's installations, sculptures, painting, and works on paper seek to inspire new ways of looking at the familiar and in the process raise questions about the state of urban space and ownership in America. Amanda has exhibited widely, including the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Venice Architecture Biennial, the MCA Chicago, and a public commission with Andres Hernandez at the Pulitzer Arts Foundation in St. Louis. She is co-designer of a forthcoming permanent monument to Shirley Chisholm in Brooklyn, New York, and part of the museum design team for the Obama Presidential Center. Williams has been recognized as a USA Ford Fellow, Joan Mitchell Painting and Sculpture Grantee, a Three Arts Next Level awardee, and is now the inaugural artist in residence at Smith College. Everyone, please welcome Amanda Williams as well, who will be facilitating and moderating this conversation tonight. And with that, I will pass it over to Amanda and Fahim to talk about this great work. Thank you, Sierra, for those fantastic introductions. Um, what's up, Fahim? Howdy. Those are great introductions. I'm, I'm humbled. On a beautiful show. We've been talking Thank about you. this forever, so it's great to yeah. be in conversation now about this. Um, so I'm going to actually give you the floor for a few minutes to let you okay. um, talk a little bit about the project as we share a couple of images. Um, so okay. for those on the Zoom who've not been able to see the show in person, this will give them a little bit of context, and then we'll jump into some questions and conversation with our panelists. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming out today and uh, spending time, especially, you know, I, I am truly humbled uh, whenever people um, uh, express interest in my work. I, I definitely want to say uh, thank you to Adrian and Mario uh, and Amanda for, for, for spending this, uh, sharing this space with me. I, it really means a lot. I'm, I, I, I really, I joke, but I'm, I'm serious um, about that. Um, I also wanted to say, you know, because of COVID, like, you know, like we now have the ability you know, I'm a, I'm a like like glass is half full type of person. I'm an optimist. Um, so now it feels like opening it up. I don't think this is a form we'll ever lose, which is great. It allows for us to be all over the world um, at the touch of a button. And it's something that we all kind of uh, are able to do at this point. Um, so uh, what, that, that being one positive aspect, another positive aspect is, um, you know, originally this show was supposed to happen a year ago. And um, although that didn't happen in the way that I originally conceived it, um, the extra time allowed me to actually make um, basically four to five bodies of work for this show. Um, the exhibition um, is actually representative of sampling of each of those kind of bodies of work. Um, so there's a lot actually more um, 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 to share, but uh, I don't, I, I, you know, this is why I love, you know, I do curate 
uh, for my arts collective floating museum. But in this instance, I really wanted to be the artist. Um, so I am very grateful for Allison uh, Peters Quinn who came in and was able to kind of like select work, which couldn't have been easy to kind of narrow it down. I think she did a wonderful job kind of selecting the work and kind of helping me to lay it out. So thank you so much, Allison, uh, uh, for your diligent work with this and the up and coming catalog and everything that uh, was done. So to give a little bit of a nutshell, especially for people who weren't able to visit the show, um, this is kind of an ongoing series. Uh, you know, this, this work is about black architecture um, uh, or this discussions about black architecture. And I guess my inroads in the black architecture was kind of loving and caring for uh, the Southside Community Arts Center, which is literally for those that um, are really kind of um, into architecture and appreciate it is a mashup. Uh, the exterior is late 1800s Georgian revival. Uh, and the interior is like 1930s kind of Chicago new Bauhaus, second generation Bauhaus coming to, you know, like, like students of the Bauhaus that were at IIT leading, you know, leaving kind of Nazi Germany and finding refuge here in Chicago. And um, they really, uh, when the Bauhaus came in, they really covered up that space and they were very intentional. There's all types of things from the 1800s kind of tucked in the walls, but they're very intentional about kind of like claiming space. So there's this really interesting mashup. Um, as the director of the space, uh, my job as a, like the executive director uh, for about, um, I was there for about seven years in the capacity as curator and executive director. My job was really about, you know, like taking up the mission of supporting artists and curating and facilities management and a little bit of fundraising. And I kind of learned all this on the space spot. But one of the benefits, things that I, as I began to learn nuances and the cracks and crevices, I could never actually spend time with those things to explore the actual building and, and, and really you know, intimately touch the walls. I mean, that's basically what this is. It's me and my passion and my love for this space and the things that I always saw, but often drew frustration that people didn't see what I saw, right? So um, I'm so happy to be able to like, like come back now that I don't have to raise money or worry about healthcare and things like that. And actually dig into what I consider this layered onion, these surfaces, it's things very simple, but the more you pull back, there's all this history and, 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 and similar to many black spaces, we have the, uh, 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 I have to be so many things. We can't just be one thing. And that's what the center was. And I began to understand that. So this show is an example of, uh, of me really delving in deep. Um, you'll see works about me kind of uh, or spending time to do rubbings of the surfaces. Um, much of my work is about the interior space, uh, the reused walls uh, from the 1940s, where you kind of build up mark making over and over and over from all the shows that were hanging. Uh, but the time, the extra time allowed me to think about my first film project, short film project, or and do a collaboration with the uh, Seldom Stance Theater to curate um, and revisit older work where I uh, did a performance in the space and invite someone else to come in and choreograph a work that spends time with the collection, that's what you're looking at now. So uh, because of my time there, I, I like to think that I've earned a, a certain amount of trust uh, from the organization to be able to come in. And when I have a weird idea, they kind of give me a little leeway to do some things. Um, and usually that ends up benefiting the center because it draws attention to the magic of the space which I consider a temple. It is a black temple of production and it still continues to be a black temple of, of production and cultivation. And, you know, one interesting thing, this is an example of the walls um, that I was kind of referring to um, uh, that uh, what you see that black and white image is the first exhibition back in 1940. Um, those are the kind of uh, new Bauhaus walls. And the idea of the design was every time you hang a show, that show, the marks of that show remain for the next show. So you end up having, in this case, 80 years of mark making. But when I first came to the center um, back in early 2000s, I always considered it black space. I didn't think about it kind of like, I always say it's new Bauhaus with soul. You know what I mean? It's like, I never considered it to be anything other than black space uh, because I think the treatment of the space and the way it was adapted to satisfy the community, it made it into a black space. So although the building itself was not a black design from the exterior and the interior was a German kind of design, uh, it, there's nothing about this that doesn't speak to soul. So we kind of take the pieces and make it fit to what we need 
So I did I always thought this mashup was a really interesting kind of thing. I'm still kind of exploring that about what happens when, you know, this building that was initially uh, the home of a grain merchant years ago has become this kind of key pivotal uh, black institution in Chicago um, and, 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 and continues to remain and produce uh, of new works and new new artists and support. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I'm just so happy to be able to be in a moment where I can explore these ideas um, and come in and out of the center as I start to move around the world and take some of these unique aspects of the center's kind of philosophy, its mission, and move it into a, a physical art practice um, as well. So, uh, yeah, I'll leave it. I, I think I'll leave it there. Maybe we can delve into some of these things. These are some images of some of the performances um, kind of, you know, over the course of the exhibition, some works from the center as well. So, yeah, this, 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 this performance just brought me so much joy to be able to do this. And yeah, I, I probably would not have done this if not for uh, the space and time, the extra year, so. So I, I was going to, um, based on some of the things you just said, I'm actually gonna, bring some things up in the reverse. Um, yeah, it's fun. So for me, this was this is an exciting conversation. Um, one, because I'm enmeshed in crazy idea of generation with Fahim on like a weekly basis. We have some idea that's not, no one else can understand. And we're like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yep, you, that's exactly what you should do. Do it, let's do it. Um, so we get to see these things evolve over time. And we're just in a magical moment, especially here in Chicago with um, creatives that um, can imagine all kinds of crazy things. And we have a, a support network and in institutions and individuals yeah. right now who really kind of foster that. And I've been equally enmeshed with Mario and Adrian in this project called Reconstructions that just closed at MoMA. Um, and so in some ways, I feel like if I hear the word black space one more time, I'm gonna <laughs> scream. <laughs> Having to think about uh, working on, you know, something that's your, your kind of life's work, but then, um, explicitly kind of having to drill down into that and then collectively all of us having to um, reckon with or be uncomfortable with other people's first reckoning with the idea that black lives matter and then therefore black space matters and then therefore black space makers matter. Um, and so that's where we find ourselves. And so I wanna kind of um, both ground us but also untether us from that so that we can, can really expand upon a kind of understanding of um, what might seem like an obvious terminology, but it's very different depending on um, who who the author is of those words and who the who the recipient is of those words. And so, you touched on on two things that I think are really important. And that was um, this idea that the the Southside Community Arts Center, because of this strategy about people sort of applying the work to the wall became 80 years of mark making so that the architecture itself became the residue. And then the idea of you um, doing the rubbings and that process of rubbing of the building at one-to-one -one scale um, in contrast to the way in which architects in the Western world at least are trained, which is that we are the proxy or the kind of um, the prosthetic to the, to the actual physical structure. Um, and so I wanna, I wanna start off by talking a little bit about um, the difference, and it's gonna seem very nuanced to the audience, but I think it's important that we just dive right into this. The difference between um, spaces that happen to be occupied by predominantly black bodies and people who are trying to conceive of space that somehow has an aesthetic or an essence of blackness. And of late, we've talked about that as a liberatory process or a liberatory project. And so I'm wondering if Mario or, or Adrian wants to jump in a little bit and talk about the ways in which they've um, thought about that in their work or have tried to verbalize um, that nuance because we all come from slightly different backgrounds. Um, Adrian's writing in a scholarly capacity, but explicitly about the built environment. Mario is, is actually building as an architect. Fahim is making with architecture as a medium and then I live somewhere in between, in between all of those. So I don't know if either one of you want to jump in and just kind of offer your thoughts or what has come up either in your work or through this last um, couple of years about the this popularity of this word and what that what that nuance means because I think it gets used interchangeably especially amongst black creatives of all kinds.
Okay, I'll go. <laughs> I really love the way you you broke that down, Amanda. That was so beautiful and um, really helpful. And I guess I think about it. When we're talking about the term black space for me. I think I I guess I think about it. Maybe if there's like a third way that I think about that term, which is the I like that term because I think what it makes you think about is the ways that blackness is always in space <laughs> um, that for blackness blackness can only exist in dimensionality and thinking about the relationship between blackness and dimensionality um, and how blackness literally does occupy a space it requires space to be <laughs> to exist right to be registered to be in relation to others um, and to itself right it's something that I I I I thought a lot about because I think in some ways it it's um, it's not always what we think about when we think about blackness, right? Um, and so thinking about the way that blackness is always in space and always in relation to space and always being perceived and understood spatially um, as well as sonically, you know, all the different ways you might perceive, right? I'm so interested in the history of perception and the history of racial perception. You know, thinking about the ways that um, Blackness and space are always inherently tethered and thinking about what that means and conceptually, practically, in terms of policy um, is, um, is what I like about that term. In some ways, it's like space, black, and then in parentheses, space, the silent space is always there. <laughs> so I like, so as you could just say black and then space is always there, but like, what does it mean to actually think about the relationship between blackness and space um, is, I think, um, a really interesting provocation for me because it's not a provocation, right? Because it's always, it's the condition of blackness itself. Yeah, um, I, I think Fahim um, said something, um, some, made some really interesting points about uh, the, the art center um, and talking about the, the treatment and the adaptation. And so when I think of, you know, this idea of black space, um, I wanna say that I think of let's say, uh, kind of a transmutation that occurs. And I think that those nail holes um, and the making of that is the kind of transmutation of that architecture, is a transmutation of that space. Um, similarly, I think the, the rubbings and the, the making of the, the shrouds are a transmutation of that because I think that architecture in its, let's say, um, present or current definition is insufficient for black life. And Ooh. that, you know, because it's preoccupied as a, as a kind of default with the subjectivity of the European white male, if, if you will. And so, you know, the, the adaptation of that space, not so much from its Georgian origins to what the uh, you know, the teachers at the at IIT brought to it in terms of new Bauhaus sort of brought to it, but it was really, I think, the, the transmutation that was made by the, the hammering of the nails, by the, the, re, the uh, residue, if you will, of these, uh, of these holes. And it made me think of, you know, as I was looking at this earlier today, of, um, something that Toni Morrison wrote in, in Race Matters, where she says that her effort to manipulate American English is not um, to take away, is not to take standard English and um, decorate it or paint over it, but to carve away at it. And so I, I think that you know, those nail holes are kind of carving away at the architecture to reveal something else. And that revelation, if you will, is perhaps you know, where, you know, as a kind of spatial practice is perhaps where this idea of black space for me comes in. Mm. Uh, that it's about a, a practice within that condition or within that enclosure. Wow. You, you know, I wrote something down listening. It's just this, this something I've always competed with in being in the center is um, that the whole narrative about the holes, my understanding of intentional design came very late. It came well after I was no longer in a mode of survival. 
you know, when I could sit back and, 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 and actually look at the archive and read the papers in a space that wasn't conceived to have an archive or have a collection, but has a collection, a space that wasn't con like, like intended to have an archive, but has an archive. And actually in reading some of the founding documents uh, or some of the first letters written by some of the initial people that read it, I actually found that I had more in common with my ideas of the center with the people who first opened the doors um, than I did with the people who were my, uh, like, like, like the people that I came right behind because I think they were kind of honed by survival. So I talk about the luxury of intentionality versus like a uh, responsive and necessity of space. And I think the school that I came into was about survival. It was about literally being one check away from the doors closing, which totally cultivates how you envision space, how you plan space out. Mm -hmm. So you have these layers of kind of survival tactics that turn in traditions, but actually they were never intended to be the original thing and it gets all mixed in. And that's what, for me right now, that's where I am. I'm actually pulling apart and questioning everything uh, at the center in a way of kind of thinking about a broader, like, like for me, the center is something I put my hands around, but, but, but like the broader context of black culture is very hard and very overwhelming. So it's like a microchasm or a macro in a way, but that's something it's like, I, I have the luxury to be intentional now. And I think I think uh, of, um, some of these like earlier designers, Mario, what you said about like some of those ideas, you know, in America, we have to adapt things to serve, do more than one thing. It can't just be architecture. Like you know, you can't just have a nice space. You, you know, it's got to have a cafeteria in it, in the community. It's got to do all these things, and it's got to do everything. And so that's the um, you know, the, the intentionality. Mm. In black space. I don't even. I didn't even know what black space was. I was just like, it's, yeah, it's just it's a space, and we got some black people in it. We gonna make it work. <laughs> that that's a. Um, I love that um, acknowledgement because uh, a huge criticism that we received as participants in the um, reconstructions exhibition was that since it was a first for that institution in that regard of um, intentionality, supposedly of inviting black people to to think about blackness in relationship to architecture in the built environment, that there was a kind of surprise and some at some points disappointment actually from the black community in some parts with our luxury of speculation. And so I think it's important to um, yeah. honor the words you just said, but also just acknowledge out loud that um, in a very short amount of time, we as makers and creatives um, are not only on the shoulders, we're like levitating above those that yeah. have come before us, some of which are still alive, uh, to be able to think about whatever we want to think about. So mm -hmm. we can make traditional yeah. things, we can make non-traditional things, we can change our mind after lunch, we can do whatever. So That's right. I'd love for everybody to talk a little bit about um, this other uh, maybe misused or overused <laughs> word of uh, futurism, but also mm -hmm. the speculative and the idea of um, the proposal of things that actually are not so radical, but because they've never been seen, they get couched often or framed in a way that sounds fantastical. So black skyscraper, <laughs> what? That, you know, blacks in ballet, blacks in hockey. You know, so if you guys could talk a little bit about how, how the idea of speculation um, or futurity um, kind of weaves its way into your practice. So if it's not something that you're consciously thinking about, I love when you said, you know, it's just gotta be, it wasn't really thinking about these terminologies, it just was. And so I think that's important as well as a kind of mode of operating, but maybe if, if everybody could just um, speak a little bit about that. Maybe we can go in reverse. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I think it, it, it's the whole notion of blackness as a monolith. And I mean, intellectually, we know this. And not only from, you know, it's, it's interesting that you say sometimes, it's like working in community space. Some of my biggest critics are actually uh, uh, people that are black, you know, and they're, they're just comfortable enough to say those things or close enough to a topic to say it. And I actually appreciate that, uh, uh, that hypercriticality because there's not many places that you can get it, but it is, we have to challenge this notion of blackness as a monolith, not only logically, but actually like, 
like viscerally. Like, so we have these reactions and the, the ability to analyze why am I reacting this way? Why can't something be different? Why, you know, we should be making, thinking about, I mean, we're just thinking. Like, we're not even talking about the making aspect. Like, we're not even talking about, you, you're talking about, like, like thinking and, and dreaming and being creative, like that, that, that's like, when you step back and look at it, that's, that's insane. Like we should be thinking about all that. We should, we should applaud our diversity and thought. And as someone who came up in the center, kind of doing figurative work, when me and Amanda first met, we met a certain way, right? And we went off and learned new things and uh, started like thinking at, from different perspectives and angles. I guess similar hypercriticality. A lot of the work that I'm doing in, in, in space is not traditionally the type of space that's shown in the center. And I think that's okay. I think, I think that's okay. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I just, I just, yeah, I think we have to make space for that. Um, versus, like, whatever type of space, but we have to make space for different types of thinking that stretches us. Um, and actually it, it, it applauds us. And sometimes when we think about, things that we think are like way out there we look back and we start researching actually they were doing this like 200 years ago we ain't doing nothing new on the sun they were doing this in in in, in, in you know dogon architecture and the dog you know like they were already doing this this ain't nothing new uh, <laughs> but we just get these ideas about how things are supposed to look so um but yeah it's yeah i can't necessarily think outside of that i mean i'm really thinking about like in, in, in criticality, being critical, institutional critique is what my work is often about, but it's actually more critical of quote unquote black space. It's actually my work as much as it is about honoring the system, it's also about uh, attacking it as a way of, of making it stronger. So I think we need to be more critical of the work that we do uh, versus just walking around patting each other on the back. We should be able to defend our work uh, no matter where it's coming from to make it stronger. Yeah, I, I, I really appreciate that, Fahim. And I, you know, I, I heard um, Arthur Jaffa say once that um, black people learned how to create art in free fall. Um, and I think that was not just, you know, art, but so many of the inventions, and Amanda, you know this because your, your research was about this, so many of the inventions that black people created were, were not necessarily thought of as, as, as art or artful, but to, to solve an immediate problem. Um, whether or not it was, you know, you know, there's this list, you know, of you know inventions by Black people that no one ever knew about, right? Um, but I would say, you know, those were creative responses. Yes, they were, you know, to an immediate thing, but which had to, let's say, solve an immediate problem. But those were creative responses. And so I think that, you know, this question of speculation, which sounds like, oh, we are moving out there into the fantastical or something. I mean, I find that a little bit problematic. One, because it assumes or, or speculation by definition, you know, is about uh, forming something without firm evidence or having enough information. We have the evidence because as Fahim said, we've been doing it for 200 years you know, we've been making. So now to have the space between you know, that immediate need and to be able to kind of imagine, you know, I would say, you know, and I'm not quite sure of the right word for it, but I'm not quite sure that I want to call it speculation because we're not doing it without firm evidence of what we've been able to do before or without, um, you know, that information. I mean, we know how to, we know how to hustle, right? I mean, that's a, that's a kind of, we, we know how to make the thing. And, and that hustle is not, you know, it's not, um, it's not being a, a, you know, a huckster, you know, that, that hustle is, you know, is coming out of our, out of our experiences. I mean, the other thing about, you know, speculation, you know, is that, you know, it assumes a risk that you're not sure that it, if it's going to pay off. And, and I think for black people, you know, the question of whether it's going to pay off, well, that's not even a question that's on the table because we also know what it means to make a way out of no way. You know, so I think that, you know, for example, the, the MoMA show, for example, the work that you're doing, Fahim, which is, you know, revealing something, you know, it's just now taking advantage of that space that we have between, 
you know, the knowledge. And now let's see what else that we can we can do with it and having the moment to really contemplate and to think about that. Yeah, I guess I just want to build on what's been said and I've been thinking about speculation in the terms of the of the title of Fahim Shell, thinking about what happens when we think about planting and maintaining as speculative acts, right? Like what is speculative maintenance look like? Which I think is in some ways like one of the provocations of the show, right? Not only is maintenance a work and an art, right? It's a, it's a, it's a mode of creativity and it's its own mode of speculation, um, which I love. So I've been thinking about that a lot. And I went, I was at this conference in 2015 um, on the architecture of HBCUs and uh, mm -hmm. it, it was at Morgan State and it was so great. I mean, it really changed my work and everything I thought about <laughs> space and <laughs> institutions and just thinking about, you know, Booker T. Washington and his ideas about bricks and building and how people should literally, you know, how Black people should literally know how to build and uh, looking at the work of Black architects on HBCUs and the work of teachers of architecture at HBCUs. And then the second half of the day was so much about how the buildings are falling apart, about deferred maintenance, which is the big issue of HBCUs, about these buildings that because they're not funded, they can't take care of them, right? And buildings have been closed down, um, torn down, not because they're not beautiful, not because they're not important, because they couldn't pay, for, they had to choose between, you know, faculty or a building. And so just thinking about like, the breadth of speculative thinking around building and blackness that was happening in the 19th century and in the early 20th century at these schools, and then the kind of creativity um, that had to kind of, that's still happening around how do you kind of <laughs> keep building but also maintain buildings, right? Um, and so there's something about that, that, that tension between planting and maintaining and the speculative work that both involve and the speculativeness of the everyday, right? That it's not, to go back to I think what everyone has been saying, right? Like we want to go to the fantastic, but sometimes you just need to be speculative yeah. about how to like get <laughs> the ground right <laughs> or how to keep it up or how to how to get it, get it watered right and I, the other thing that i did today was i was thinking i went to um merrill laterman's ukulele's uh manifesto for maintenance and was thinking about that in relationship to fahim's work and her her terms are development and maintenance and i was just thinking about development and maintenance as a tension versus planting and maintenance and um how much I like planting better, I think, uh, as the as the tension there, and and maybe it's because um, there's an aesthetic and there's a there's a there's a quiet beauty to the speculative nature of those acts of everyday homage and taking care of that I think that your lang you give language to I think in the title of the show, but also in the work that that's in the show. That's really beautiful. It makes me it makes me think about um, it also makes me think about like spirituality in a very interesting way when you're saying that this there's a hope or there's a kind of belief or an understanding that you're gonna this thing is going if I'm being very literal about like a seed right like you're like literally putting that in the ground and you just have an understanding of the land or of the cosmos and you just know that what's going to happen and you know the, the closer you are to those of us who that have us have that as their kind of embodied existence, you could feel the soil, you know, what kind of soil, you know, the age of the seed, you know, the, and so for me, I've always been so enamored of Fahim um, using those panels over and over again. And so at some point that was an efficiency and it was like, well, I'm gonna use that same wood. I don't have to buy nothing the next time. <laughs> no, I, I've left the same nail hole when I got to put it together. So to go from, you know, so, Early on, when when you built, you know, at the MCA for your solo show there, when you had it as a um, as an installation at Expo, when you had, you know, so over and over again, also that that kind of ritual of practice, mm -hmm. that repetition is also a kind of faith building as well. So it was so beautiful when you called um, the center a temple of production because it mm -hmm. is about a kind of it's it's a maintenance, but it's also a, a kind of um, sustainability or sustenance in a way that that we're not talking about that word in this moment mm -hmm. in that same way you know it's it's especially in architecture it's lead it's certified it's cork it's bamboo it's you know it's not about a kind of there's a there's a desire to have a understanding about cultural sustainability and environmentalist sustainability but it's very hard for people to make that leap when they've thought about the object 
and they haven't thought about the embodiment of the materials. And that's so much of what black people in America, at least historically have thought about the bricks that, you know, you could own your house and at any time somebody could make up a rule for why they're gonna take it away from you. You know, so the, the kind of preciousness and the faith that's just inherent in the idea of, you know, engaging with the environment in a way that's not speculative, right? But that's, that's uh, that holds faith or holds, holds hope each time you're kind of doing that action. So, you know, and there's something also about the kind of everyday or what Mario was talking about a little bit earlier, right? So it's actually not so fantastical or speculative. And so the, the everydayness of it, but the ability to be productive, that's also what I feel, you know, you've really captured in terms of um, wanting to not only um, kind of register the center, but then also project it. So for me, another really exciting part is, is um, at night, the, the performance and some of the still images are projected onto a surface at the top of the High Park Art Center. And so I think that's also a beautiful testimony about um, blackness being able to be in two spaces at once, yeah. artists in Chicago being able to occupy multiple realms of art conversation at once, um, elevating things that seem quotidian to another level, mm -hmm. like all of that is also going on um, in this kind of meta, this kind of application of the application of the application. I think that's really strong. And it's, and for me, it also says like, I'm here or acknowledge me. And the nails do that, the, the holes in the walls do that too, right? It's like, it's a registration that something existed and we've for so long had erasure. But so this work embodies it so much more beautifully than just saying erasure or addition or, you know, so not that these words aren't genuine in the practices of so many of our contemporaries right now, but it gets hard to really understand the power of that. You know, so by marking and rubbing, it's, it's actually a kind of uh, resistance to erasure in a way that maybe seems obvious, but actually is, is much more um, mm -hmm. radical than it might seem, you know? You know what is he doing? Is he, he's rubbing the building? What is he do? Why didn't he just take a picture of it? Why didn't, can't you just draw it? Yeah, right. I get, I get that a lot. So you know you could have just took a picture, right? I can't tell how good. You know you could Is he gonna do that all day long? How long does it take? <laughs> They're gonna give him money for that? You know, but I think the way that, there's a way that it's an architect. I like it too, because I'm fascinated by people who are not trained as architects, who are doing mm -hmm. these gestures from a very um, visceral standpoint. Tokwase is another, Tokwase Dyson, who's a Chicagoan um, originally, who's out there. And she's just, you know, mining away. She's like, the square is the rhombus. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like, but really just mining at what it means to make marks, right? And so in a way we're like recapturing what architecture can be in a way that's not necessarily how, how Mario and I were trained or how, how Adrian might have been trained to think about um, built environment. So I just wanted to toss out the word temple or evoke ideas about mm -hmm. spirit as well um, in a way that hopefully is not cliche, but I think that the, to Adrian's point, the title of the planting, it's like that, you know, it's a, it's a gesture of hope or a gesture of confidence maybe is even a better word that, mm -hmm. that this action is going to yield something else. Um, so for me, I like that, that it's, that it's a, it's a ritual for you over a long period of time as well. So each time it yields something else, the harvest yes. is different for you each time, if mm -hmm. I want to be super cliche. What, what else comes to the other thing that comes to, to mind, I, I suppose is, is the notion of interiority, um, which is not simply about being in the interior, but it's, a uh, perhaps an, an embodiment. And I think that, you know, I'll just kind of go back to the, what I was saying earlier about transmutation that the, the you know, the rubbing, the, you know, the moving one's hand over that surface is, is an embodiment of the meaning that transforms the, the form, which is what people see if they say, oh, why can't you just take a picture? You know, that's about the aesthetics of the form and the aesthetics of, of, of the image. But this is, you know, like, what does it feel like? What is it, you know, how do we think of enclosure not as something which is um, confining, but enclosure, which is something which is, let's say, opening the body up to, to relate to space in a much different way. Mm -hmm. um, 
and so I think that, yeah, I think that's a, that, I think that's a radical act actually. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a very radical act to, you know, yeah, to spend however many hours it's, it's taking to, you know, and to not just make a visual impression, but I think it's also the, the performance of doing that. I mean, it is very much about a journey um, and it is about invisible labor. Um, Adrian, your point about planting, um, it, it is really spot on in, in a way of thinking about how I learned how to take care of that building. You know, I learned from a gentleman named Howard Seals, you know, and Howard Seals is not going to pop up any research. You can't Google Howard Seals, but he literally like a farmer would hold that center together with duct tape and tar when we couldn't afford to do it. He, he put stuff in the boiler, cornflakes in the, you know what I mean? He, he knew how to hold that. He learned that from someone else. And like, he would walk me through and say, okay, when it's spring, you got to go up and put tar on this spot because if you don't do that, it's going to come through here at the gallery. You're going to get a stain right there. This is how you lay this ladder with this ladder and this ladder, change that one light bulb. And it was just at some point, you're like, why don't we just put in new, <laughs> like, like, there's a better way to do this. But he's like, shut up. This is how you do it. Like, you plant a seed, you know, you water it. And you, and he would just take me through these things. And, I mean, I, I, intimately, I would know he would take me in the basement. The basement's kind of creepy. You know, a lot of people go, I'm very comfortable in the basement because I spend a lot of time in the basement, even though it is actually a pretty scary basement. But he would just go, this is how you hold it together. And if you miss a day, if you miss a day, this is what's going to happen. And sure enough, he passed away and things happened. The coach house out back, it went quick. Mm -hmm. He was holding that thing together and it went quick, you know. And um, so, it, it, yeah, as I think, you know, I think about that slow every day. I find a lot of joy in that. And it is very personal to touch the walls, to touch the space. To, to worship in a way. Um, that's exactly, Mar, you, you caught it. It doesn't look like the center. Like the, the running doesn't look anything like it. I mean, it, it, it's like a ghost, it's ghostly. But uh, it's kind of kept trying to do a rubbing of the spirit. And that's exactly what it is. And the scale of it is because I think it's a big deal. I think it's a big deal and it should be a big deal. But I always felt like I'm screaming because we're on Michigan Avenue and there's Every day, it's thousands and thousands of people. And every decade, someone's like, we should put a sign out there to pull people in. But they still don't come in. I just It's just a way of screaming, like, this is a, a giant, and it needs to be treated as such. You know, so that's the scale of it. Maybe talk a little bit, too, about, um, I know uh, Mario has done performance and is, is delving more and more into performance in relationship to architecture and, and objects that he's making and I've just dipped my toe thanks Anna Martine White yeah. into, yeah. into, into performance but talk a little bit about why that was in, important to you or you know we've talked all around the body in this conversation and I'm I'm yeah. struck lately that I've spent most of my life making something that's absent of the body while thinking 100% of the body and how what a strange kind of condition that is and so I was excited when I saw not only the performances, but the, then the projection of the performance and then a second kind of iteration of it in the High Park Art Center. So maybe talk about that evolution of wanting to perform. You used to occupy the, yeah. the garden or the perennial garden when you would use yeah. the mouthpiece. So talk a little bit about that evolution into um, performance and maybe describe yeah. a little bit the relationship to the performer that you've um, developed the work with. Yeah. Um... So, you know, this is that thing about, you know, I stepped away from the center. Well, no, excuse me. I actually became executive director while I was in grad school. But while in grad school, I started getting exposed to different types of work. When I first, when I came from Howard, I went pretty much, you know, within a year, I was doing my work full time and then working at this space within two or three years as a curator, volunteer, as someone who just loved the space. And um, my art was something that I used to eat. Like I had to make cells. So I had to do the commission of the flowers or someone wanted something to match their couch. And I was like, I'm gonna match that couch because I gotta eat. Um, but 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 then, you know, when I went to grad school, it was an opportunity for me to start learning about performance and film and all alter, alternate things. And then as I started to take that knowledge in, I really kind of fell in love with John Cage in a lot of ways and some of the work that he was doing. 
And there was a particular piece, a uh, silence piece. I think it's a piece where he sits at the piano, right? And um, what I thought was really great, I thought it was a brilliant piece as a composition. But the same thing I thought about was that silent as John Cage is sitting at that piano, the person who pushed that piano out on the floor was invisible and silent, right? So, so I started thinking about the notion of administration. And this was the time when I, I wanted to merge the process of ru running and loving the arts institution as an arts administrator into a performance piece. So I started doing various things, and one of them specifically was pushing the piano because the center has a piano in it because that's what you're supposed to have in the gallery. <laughs> right? You know, it's just accepted. That's what you get, of course. You ain't got no piano in your gallery? What's wrong with you? You ain't doing the gallery work then. So we have this piano that's just not questioned, and um, an artist, well, uh, you know, pushed it across the floor. Uh, I was invited as a... Um, a guest curator. So Theaster actually was the guest curator. I brought in the curator show from Marva Jolly and he pushed this piano for some reason across the floor. And when I asked him, why you pushed the piano across the floor? He said, I don't know. I'm trying to change up the space. And then he left and didn't push the damn piano back and left me with this piano. I was like, man, you gotta be kidding me. So, it, you know, I, this is the point that I, the pinnacle point where I got frustrated and it was just like, I ain't no piano pusher. I, I'm an executive director. I don't be pushing no damn pianos. Like, you know, so this is when I emerged. So that's when the world collided. I said, well, what if I make that into a performance? I'm going to push this piano across. I wasn't really thinking about performance. I was thinking about a way of marrying and making sure something that felt pointless could be positive. And I married them too. So now it becomes a performance. The video that you see with uh, Damon uh, Green and uh, Carrie, uh, 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 who, who, who was a choreographer, um, uh, is a revisiting of that kind of first movement of a very grainy uh, kind of video. And I kind of brought it back to think about the suit, like, because I wore this suit, which is supposed to be kind of a costume. Um, so this was, you know, something that I did once that I really found joy. I wanted to revisit it and be intentional about it. So the other, the one I did the first time, I, I kind of grabbed, you know, I just really quickly kind of cobbled something together. I'm going to try this. And this one was highly, very intentional uh, with a whole bunch of cameras, you know, you know, really laid out, lots of rehearsal. Um, so, so, but the space, it's three things in this video is the collection. So I'm very proud to have Jeff Donaldson, Charles White, uh, 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 Bernard Goss and uh, two others I'm forgetting in the background. So it's a way of calling out the collection. It was magical about space and then the walls, which are like skin to me. It, it feels like a skin. And then the physical, the, the, the figure who is literally dragging, pulling, kicking and screaming. It's called push-pull. Uh, the organization from one side of the room to the other. And that's it, these are all metaphors for what I used to feel, my frustration, my passion, my love. Um, so it's revisiting that. That's what it feels like. That's what it felt like. And I don't, it doesn't just feel like that for me, as I share a lot of art administrators working in cultural institutions, they feel this way. They love it. They hate it at the same time. It's a love-hate relationship of, 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 of all of these things that you're pulling and pushing on um, and oftentimes very isolating and frustrating. So it's been really great visiting it and, and doing my first, produce short film and I, I hope to do more now uh, that I have a, a taste for it so some of the uh, Amanda I've cut my teeth oh no oh crap uh, I'm going to invite folks to to toss questions in the chat if you have any um, while we keep talking a little bit I want to ask Fahim to talk about one last thing that um, is maybe not so obvious from the images but I think is quite powerful which is the um, the work you have where you, where you're doing the, um, I don't even know what you would call it on the, on the drywall. There's a paint, I call it a painting. It's not a painting, but it occupies that beautiful eggplant wall, um, and really holds that space. So if you can talk a little bit about that, that last piece. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the center is like a, a tree and a trunk and it has like branches. And when I came to the center, um, I met Margaret Burroughs. Um, who, who was, for those that don't know, uh, the founder of the Sabra Museum. And she learned about institution building as a young person at Southside Community Arts Center. And then eventually, 
opened her own space when she realized that, you know, just educating her class because she was frustrated with the lack of diverse curriculum in her classroom. And she complained about it. And this is, this is real important, I think, to this conversation as well. She complained about that lack of diversity that she knew better and they didn't change the curriculum. So she said, I'm going to do it myself. And she turned a coach house into a showroom, a salon, and then eventually got the house and just started educating people. And people started coming and they started calling the museum. And then she realized, oh, well, we ain't got no black museum. We ain't got, we don't, there, there isn't one. There is no African American. So, okay, what I need to, let me, let me, let me, I don't know nothing about that, but I'll figure it out. And she figured it out. So it was adapting space to community adapting space to need and at first when I met I just knew she was an important person um but as I spent time really analyzing her methods if she wouldn't call them out directly she spoke about her work as like the most logical response to a situation you know it's just that necessity thing like well the black the people the kids need to eat so we're gonna make a cafeteria in the museum that was her last and it's just like okay that's I guess that's what we need to do. Um, but, but, but yeah, so that piece is me thinking of her as uh, a lot of the materials I use are literally building materials is drywall. And it's, it's really a, um, analyzing her work and zooming in really tightly and blowing it up. And then thinking about printmaking as a, like thinking about the block as a tool that projects into space. So uh, a lot of things you'll see like timbers, wood, drywall, bricks, uh, as literally thinking about building institutions, like what are the actual materials, the metaphors for actually building space. So that's what that is. It's, it's uh, revisiting one of her prints, really zoomed in tight. It's called Faces. And um, that I have a series of those that I, I've done in drywall. And I don't know if it was um, you and Allison collaborating, but just talk a little bit also about then that placement in terms of how you've situated it within the High Park Art Center, because I think that in terms of transforming a space or Mario's idea of transmutation of a space, just even giving physically compositional space to a work like that, I think was just a really powerful move. Yeah, thank you. I, I have to give credit to Allison for that. Um, that piece is probably one of the most fragile pieces I have. Uh, because of its size, and once you cut into a piece of drywall, as we know, that's pretty much there's a there's a slow process of it kind of. So it's something you have to handle very fragile. And I'm a metal salt of my training, so I'll be banging on stuff, you know. So it's been in storage for a while, and she came and climbed through and, and saw it and said, "I would really like to bring this piece out again." Um, I did it some time ago at Iceberg Projects. Um, and it's been in storage and I'm so happy she chose it and I haven't seen it in open space. So it was really like, you know, it's like when you see something that's packed away, you see, you say, oh yeah, I like this. But I've been walking by it and packing every day for like almost 10 years. So it, it was really a great choice. Probably uh, one of the throwbacks uh, of one of my previous bodies of work. So, and yeah, that, that, that was her choice to put it in that area. Um, so I really love it. And um, yeah. That's why it's nice to have a curator because I've been trying to jam in all my photographs. I had 20 photographs. I'd be like, we got to get them all in. He was like, no, we're going to do two. Thank you. <laughs> Adrian, did you want to jump in? I didn't know if you. I mean, I'm happy to. I mean, I also love the placement of it and the ways that it's speaking to the, to the, um, um, to the rubbing in front of it and the, the way that they kind of talk to each other about what it means to cut into and carve out of and uh what it means to think about you know built space as as canvas as shroud as homage as something that is a way of remembering and moving but isn't document isn't isn't reducible to the documentary um and they just they really are in such a beautiful um conversation with one another in the ways that even it being kind of almost, you know, on the wall behind the shroud, but next to it, um, like even th that spatial placement is just so powerful. My daughters were describing it as, because we come from the side often from inside of the center. And so they see it as a curtain for the stage. And so they're like, that's the performer. Like there's the performer. It's like, I guess so. 
<laughs> they, they, they need to be my curator. If you, I'm gonna bring them to the studio, they're going. Come and get them. Come get them. <laughs> uh, but I want to go back one more time just to the idea of um, selfishly, because I'm obsessed now with thinking about performance. But but also there was a moment um, when, at least when I saw it, kind of first revealed, or when the when the show was first um, opening it almost does seem like a body is behind that. So like actually the mm -hmm. construction of the components and then the way that the shroud or the rubbings kind of yeah. drape over it. And so I'm wondering to your, your comments about scale and wanting it to be big or wanting to say I'm here or, you know, when they were mm -hmm. actually resting on the physical building. Um, and just thinking of a scale of like um, black bodies not always being allowed to just like take up just take up space and be able to like do like that. And, and so then I think about the ability to scale up and work. Um, what do you, what do you think? I mean, you've already floated a museum down a, down a river. So maybe this is it, maybe this comes down in scale from that, but what do you, are there thoughts you have about scale in that, in that regard, like literal scale in terms of what might be next, you know, as builders, well, you're always thinking, yeah. you know, we're able to kind of, contract and, and expand in terms of scale and can imagine multiple stories or, you know, a one room pavilion. And so for you, as somebody who's a maker using building materials and th thoughts about space, what are the yeah. kind of next scales for you? Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm ready for, you can obviously see, I was really happy to be in that space, the challenge space, right? I, I'm, you know, I'm ready to challenge space um, and excited about it, but you, you're right. It, it, um, there are columns behind there that I made out of the perennial garden previous works, kind of, you know, and I, I, it was kind of mimicking thinking about columns and, and uh, kind of masking an architecture covering it. I mean, the thing about this piece that, I mean, it's kind of in the title too, you know, planning and maintaining perennial garden is an ongoing series. And Adrian, I don't know if this came out, but that's a title, that's a tip, that title actually comes from uh, Anna Tyler. She wrote an essay in the International Review called Planting and Maintaining a Perennial Garden. And it was my first, it was my first text I ever really read about the center. And it was something that I used to educate people about the center. And um, I never questioned the title. And it took me years to say, why did she name it that? Because she doesn't talk about it. And to your point, when you start, when you look it up, it's like, oh, this is a really, so it is, it, it's the name of the wood as it gets used over and over and over. And it, there's always kind of a, a hyphen to it. So this one is called Shroud. And I was actually a little nervous about that name. Um, I got a lot of trouble. I did a thing called Demise of the Southside Community Art Center. Some time ago, I was director and literally attacked the center, sending out images of it on fire, um, uh, saying that the, shit, the building was closing. And there's, that was my whole thesis. But it's a death shroud. Literally about death. It's literally about covering a cultural institution. It's really literally about challenging why these our institutions are necessary. Like it's, I just don't think it's enough to sit on the laurels of ethics and say, well, it just should be here because it's always been here. I think I think we should look to the past, but we also have to look to the future, and we have to produce. Can't just sit. And this goes for HBCUs. You know, I, I come from Howard. And as much as I love Howard, I'm often very frustrated about how we don't push and lead the way. And we sit back and we think about our James Porters and our, Afri you know. So this is about, it's a true challenge of an institution, but I think we're strong enough, as Mario said, we're strong enough to stand and push. We can do this, but we, we have to challenge us. So it is literally a death trap. In one instance, another instance, it comes alive when you open the doors and it starts moving. So it, it's a body. That's 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 what I'm referencing. Thinking of the building as a body, in a way. So I, I haven't got you know that. Unfortunately, I don't think anyone's gone that dark or deep. But that's what it is. And I, I was actually expecting more crit. I was I was I was nervous. I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm gonna get canceled. Oh, uh, but but that hasn't been the case actually. Uh, you use very uh, positive feedback. But, yeah, I, I'm really sorry that I'm not going to have the opportunity to. Um, to see the exhibition in, 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 in person because I'm so blown away by, by what I've seen in the photographs. And um, you called it a death shroud. And I was also thinking resurrection. 
actually, yeah. and how right. the, the shroud is is a new kind of architecture. I mean, it's a transmutation of the of that building of that of that interior, but the performance reveals this other relationship to the body, because you know, as we know, most architecture wasn't created or designed with black bodies, you know, as the subject, you know, you know, black bodies are seen as maids or butlers or in some, you know, subservient position, pushing the piano, which I love that story that you're, that you're talking about in terms of pushing the piano. So that performance allows us to reconceive the black body as the subjectivity in relationship to that building, but also in relationship to that, to that shroud. So it's, so it is a kind of, resurrection i think in um I mean, so so powerful i think to you know to see that performance um yeah i mean i, I think it's really brilliant i'll get you we'll get you some video some documentation mario i appreciate appreciate that mario maybe you can talk a little bit more you know your book dark space was like was like so transformative for me um just thinking about what does it what does the question of um, if, if we're not in survival and we're not thinking about um, saving as a kind of last resort, what does it mean to make a new? Or what, you know, if, if we're imagining what Fahim then thinks these spaces could be in the future, or if we can start from a position of now or a position of um, authority, what does that, what does that look like to you? Like literally, literally, formally, aesthetically, what are the things that you think about in that way? Or is that even a way that you're approaching design when you are building architecture, capital A? Yeah, I, I think for me, that's why performance is um, so uh, interesting as a way of thinking about architectural representation. Because um, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Amanda, I mean, as, as architects, we were trained a certain way of representing buildings without people. Right, you know, the, the plan is an abstraction or the section, you know, um, when we photograph buildings, we never put people or want people in the photograph of the building that we're making, right? We're like, get out of the way, get out of the way. Let me, let me take this photograph. And so, um, and, and I think that's also because, you know, the subject is the default, right? We, we're all taught that this subject is some kind of universal subject, which is not, universal right so for me performance is interesting because it allows you know allows another kind of subjectivity to enter into architecture um, and to enter into and to enter into space and i think that that's where we can think about the ways in which you know black people have always had to kind of navigate maneuver you know, sort of move through space in, in unexpected ways, in, in ways in which the plan cannot describe, in ways in which the architectural drawing um, cannot describe. And, um, and in addition to performance, I've been thinking, okay, you know, we have to make architecture then like Thelonious Monk. Or we have to make mm. architecture mm. like Mayor Bearden, right? We have to think about, you know, the the push and push of, of scale. We have to think about that kind of movement. We have to think about, you know, this fluidity. We have to, you know, so it's not, so I don't think the conventional modes of architectural representation are, I don't think they're adequate either. Um, and so I've been much more interested in what artists were doing, like, like our friend Tarquoise and sculptors and, you know, and performance artists, you know, as a way of, of bringing in I don't want to use say an other, but bringing in a different body, a different subjectivity. Maybe even a different lens. Yeah, just a, you know, it, it's so expansive. And so that's why I was really keen to make sure we had this conversation as part of Fahim's programming, because I often forget that he is actually not trained as an architect because two thirds of our conversations are about <laughs> building stuff, like things at a huge scale and, you know, kind of massively. So I was like, no, he's got to come over to the dark side with the. <laughs> yeah. The point, I'm not trained I'm as an administrator either or a curator. Okay. <laughs> yes, you are. You are. I'm, 
I'm a metal sculptor. I'm a welder. That's what I was trying to do. <laughs> but I do want to share also with the audience um, in thinking about, you know, a lot of the audience tonight or, or also a lot of the audience maybe in Chicago doesn't know that there's a groundswell right now of a lot of people in the architectural community or the built environment community, um, kind of black pioneers that are imagining all these things in real time. So uh, Dark Matter University is a group that's made up of a cross section of architects and planners and urban designers and artists and poets and all kinds of people that are really literally reimagining curricula, teaching in multiple places at the same time, like really trying to push the canon and also um, share information, um, which is also something that we're not often encouraged to do. Um, there is an organization called Black Space that has chapters, one in Chicago, but um, a primary one in New York. So I just also, and then Mario and I are part of Black Reconstruction Collective, which was born out of um, our exhibition at MOLA. So, so really it's an exciting renaissance, a moment when you, talk, when you talked about Margaret Burroughs, it made me think about another era and multiple eras in Chicago as always having been so central to er eras of kind of movements of just doing it and not knowing what to expect and then really becoming that kind of crown jewel, whether that's Afro-Cobra, um, it's leaving me the acronym, but the the uh, music, Af African-American music, hey, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So. So also the making and the doing just just flows into other things when they happen as a kind of perfect storm in a moment. Um, so I felt like I'd be remiss if I didn't just acknowledge that while we might not have our, you know, our, our multi-story black skyscraper yet, or we might not have our space station yet, although I'm waiting on my patent to come back, there's, um, there's a lot of work afoot constantly. And so back to that point of loving that there's, there's a, um, there's multiple voices and that we all support each other. It's not an either or, it's not a, a Booker T, you know, versus some boys, all of these, you know, like this idea of, of Malcolm or Martin, right? There's, we, we are the generation that benefits from not having to be binary or getting to be non-binary. Um, so I think that that's, that's, your work falls right into that. Um, I'm also gonna toss in the name of Lauren Housie. She's another one who trained as an architect. And I like to say to her, the profession couldn't hold you. So now she's an Ooh. artist using architecture as her medium um, and scaling way tiny and then really big. Um, so I'm excited to see how all of these practices kind of, you know, influence and infuse into one another and the stuff we'll, we'll keep making. I don't know if there were any questions. Let me see if anybody's tossed any questions in the chat. But if you all have questions for each other, Oh, questions for each other. Um, well, I'd love to hear a little more about the, the collective that you and Mario are, are working with and, um, you know, following the exhibition and understanding kind of like, it, 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 like, like, like getting into necessity. Is it a necessity to, like, do you feel like you're in a moment of like, we, we like like a frantic need to do something because I do feel pressure that I feel like for me it's like I need to my time's precious you know I I, I want to do these there's these things I need to do to set up I, you know um, do, do y'all feel like what, how are you feeling about that is that more of kind of a private space or something that's going to project out into so I'll I'll give my take and then I'm curious to hear what Mario will say too I think I think it's Genesis in a way came out of a kind of necessity, but also came out of a kind of um, to whom much is given, much is expected. And so mm -hmm. if, if, a, if a cultural space is, a, is traditionally a space where you come and sort of witness something and then it goes away, that seemed insufficient for the level of opportunity we had in the platform and visibility to sort of be um, singled out and made special as 10 of so many that no one will ever know about and so many that are operating in real time at the same time. And so by creating an institution, it actually helps the ideas and the importance of, of that as a topic live beyond the, the short run of the exhibition. 
And so in a lot of ways, it pays homage to your talk about including administration into your artistic practice or the idea of a Southside Community Center as an extension of, of the WPA, um, that, the, that the physical building of an institution is critical um, to the work of the content that we're all describing. Um, so I don't know, I wouldn't say that there was a pressure, but there definitely was kind of a, a bought sense, if I use my grandmother's terms, it's got an understanding that this, we can't just be patting ourselves on the back. It's got to mm -hmm. do a little bit more than that. That's a, that's a tall order when you're also trying to <laughs> think about the spatiality of blackness, as Adrian said, in <laughs> real time and be in COVID homeschool or whatever else you had to, you know, survive in this last year. Um, but it just felt like it was, we just knew it needed to happen and we had the facility to do it. And those are, those are privileges that, you know, are born of all the people that have been able to do it before us. So that was, that was really important that way. And I do think our intention is that it's going to be outward. Um, we, you know, we're not even a year old, so we've done a lot and had a lot of visibility very quickly, but the idea was always that it's, it's consistently sharing while doing, we're also sharing. Um, and so that's a kind of productivity that also was a very different way of, of working um, and generating creativity. So Mari, I don't know if you, how you felt about it, but that was, that's how it always felt to me. It didn't feel like pressure in, in a kind of burdensome way. Uh, absolutely, I, I would agree with that. And I think that it's, um, you know, along with that initial, let's say, uh, feeling of, of necessity was a, was a recognition that our strength lay not necessarily in the, the individuals of us, but in us as a group and you know, as you know, the model of, of, of architects is always this kind of single heroic figure. Um, and I think there was a resistance. We recognize that, well, one, that really doesn't work for black people, um, you know, and that we recognize that there was, uh, yeah, you know, to use the cliche power in numbers, I suppose, um, but that this started with you know, the initial 10 of us who were trained as architects because the show actually inc includes 11 exhibitors, um, but very much with the intention of expanding um, and opening up and going beyond the 10, but also being able to support others. You know, so we formed a 501c3, um, you know, with and, and have been raising money in order to then sort of grant, make grants, you know, to other uh, black designers and, and people of color who are, you know, architects, designers, artists, what have you, who have, you know, who have projects, you know, so that we are, yeah, passing it on, paying it forward, um, you know, providing more shoulders for others to stand upon. Great. Great. This feels like a yeah. natural end unless there's other comments or conversations. I'm tossing a couple of things in the in the um in the chat. We'll do the John Cage in there and everything. Look at that. Take a little peek at <laughs> man to be on it. I I can't keep a man to be like doing 20 things. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's go. Oh, I'd be I'd be ashamed if I also did not mention that Fahim and I are part of a project called the Black Wall Street Journey. Our co-conspirators are having a second conversation as we speak <laughs> with Natalie right. Moore. Oh, really? Hello, I forgot about that. And yeah. Dion Foreman. So we've also formed a collective that will that will serve as a kind of institution um, to reimagine or to imagine what Black prosperity looks like, um, mm. inspired by Tulsa, but in Chicago. So that too, Fahim and I have talked a lot about institutions in that way and just trying to understand what it means to create um, and the labor behind that. Um, so I'll give them a shout out. They're speaking Black people in two spaces. Yeah, right. Yeah, now. at yeah. Arts and uh, hosted by Arts and Public Life. Hosted by Arts and Public Life. Right here. Yeah. <laughs> She's got a clone. She's on the <laughs> I win. It's, it's a lot going on. It's a lot going on. <laughs> So with that, I think we can we can um, thank Fahim, thank Mario, well, thank you. Adrian, thank Sierra and Allison and the entire Hyde Park Arts Center team um, for bringing us together and also for thank you. 
I mean, the literal space, that's a, that's always, I'm being a lot of cliches there. It's a tall order. That's that, to <laughs> occupy that space. Fo Wilson is with us. She did it masterfully. That's right. John Price did it many years ago masterfully. Susie Giles, the list goes on and on. And right. we have we have a lot of space makers in Chicago um, that that bring it every time. So Fahim joins that that esteemed Thank group. You. Thank you. I'll turn it back over Thank to Sierra. Me. I'm gonna stick up a, a bunch more um, links in, but I'll turn it back over to Sierra. Yes, thank you all so much for joining us this evening for this very rich and fruitful conversation. It's been wonderful to hear more about the exhibition, the words derived from all of the connections that we've made to architecture and space making. And I hope that if you haven't seen the exhibition that you will come to the Hyde Park Art Center and check that out. It will be up until July 24th. And we are officially open to the public now. We're accepting walk-ins now. So our hours are Monday through Friday from 10 to 5, Wednesday until 8 p.m. and Saturday from 10 to 3 p.m. So hopefully you'll come over here and also make sure that you check out the space that the exhibition is inspired by. The Southside Community Art Center does have a amazing show that will be opening on July 17th with Bo Lavelle as a part of the MacArthur um, Towards a Common Cause exhibition. So um, please make your way over there as well. We need to support these Black spaces and the people who are creating them as well. And with that, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to our panelists and keep doing the great work that you're doing and filling those voids. Not that they are voids, but we need to transcend scarcity and keep doing and making and creating. So thank you all so much. Everyone have a thank great you. day. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Bye. Bye.